So it's really with great enthusiasm that I introduce to you this evening Ambassador Li Daoyu, Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to the United States. Ambassador Li presented his credentials in Washington on June 23rd of this year, and prior to that time, as many of you know, he was the permanent representative of the People's Republic of China to the United Nations and ambassador to the United Nations from June 1990 to February 1993. Ambassador Li graduated from the University of Shanghai in 1952 and immediately entered China's Foreign Service. Uh, he sub subsequently was appointed a Deputy Division Chief, then Division Chief, then Deputy Director of the Department of International Organizations in the Foreign Ministry of China. He then became Deputy Permanent Representative of China to the United Nations Office in Geneva from 1983 to 1984. Before assuming his most recent post with the United Nations, uh, Ambassador Li was Director of the Department of International Organizations and Conferences of the Foreign Ministry from December 1984 to May 1988, and Assistant Foreign Minister of China from May 1988 to May 1990. In addition, Ambassador Li has held many other posts representing the PRC in important conferences internationally, and in, he has headed several very important delegations on behalf of his country to ministerial meetings including the Drug Summit and the Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. This evening, Ambassador Li will be addressing us on China's domestic agenda and foreign policy. So would you please join me in welcoming Ambassador Li Daoyu to the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Albrecht. Thank you for your kind words about my country and myself. And since uh, you was just in China two weeks ago, so I'm afraid uh, you're in a better position than I, <laughs> than I am <coughs> to talk about China. Because uh, your knowledge about China is more up to date than, <laughs> than mine. <clears throat> so I, was, I also want to acknowledge my deep gratitude to the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs for inviting me to address this distinguished audience. Indeed, I have been looking forward to this opportunity to meet with you all and to exchange views with you on Chinese domestic economic situation and the foreign policy issues. Since I began my present mission as Chinese ambassador to Washington in April this year, I've had the opportunity to speak to many organizations like yours. Wherever I went, be it on the West Coast or the Midwest, I was deeply impressed by the tremendous amount of goodwill in this country for the Chinese people. I've been particularly struck by the increasing interest among the American public in the current situation in China. It is widely recognized that China, with its ancient civilization and 1.2 billion population, is going through a very exciting period of historic, ex historic changes. People all want to know how these changes relate to China's foreign policy and affect relations between China and the United States. Here I should like to offer some personal observations. To understand the dynamism, dynamism and excitement that sees China today, I think it is useful to take a look at the background of the world events and trends. With the end of the Cold War, there is a new emphasis on economic power in international relations. Heightened expectations and advances in technology act as powerful catalysts and peace and development have become the most important challenges for the international community. Faced with the new reality of intense competition and growing interdependence, Countries around the world are quickly adopting 
policies to develop the economy while getting together to address various problems affecting them all. Today, the world attention is focusing on the Asia Pacific. This is a region that has maintained the relative political stability and has become the most economically dynamic region in the world. It contains 40% of the world's population and has a combined gross national product that accounts for half of the world's total. It also generates 40% of world trade. Following many years of sustained growth, the region's average growth rate this year is expected to exceed 7%. While there are still factors making for instability in the region, as well as challenges to maintain the high growth in the rest of this decade and into the next century, the overall picture is fairly encouraging. It makes a sharp contrast with the political turbulence and economic difficulties that beset some other parts of the world. Last week, the EPEC held its fifth ministerial meeting in Seattle, and this was followed by an informal EPEC leadership conference. We think this was a significant event and will make positive contributions to better economic cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. A key player in the regional economic development is China. According to Asian Development Bank officials, the rapid growth of China's economy has played the leading role in the overall growth in Asia, acting as a locomotive for the region. Indeed, China has achieved a sustained annual growth of 9% during the past 15 years. This is the result of the reform and the opening up program championed by Mr. Deng Xiaoping, who has proved suitable under China's actual conditions and has won the support of people of all nationalities in our country. This basic policy will remain firm and irreversible. China is expected to achieve a high GMP growth this year, as it did last year. That is around 13%. We want to further deepen the reform so as to resolve the various problems arising in the course of the fast development. Earlier this month, the third plenum of the 14th Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party adopted a number of decisions to accelerate the building of a socialist market economy. The, decision, the decisions set out the basic framework for a new economic structure, which will provide vigorous impetus and sure safeguard to sustain China's rapid and healthy economic development. One of the aspects of the recent decision made by this conference concerns deepening the reform of the system of foreign economic relations and opening wider to the outside world. The idea is to build on the tremendous successes we have achieved in changing the methods of foreign trade and attracting foreign investment. China's foreign trade volume will hit a record high of 190 billion US dollars this year. Of this total, Exports will amount to $90 billion, while imports will increase 24% over last year to reach $100 billion. We will continue to open our market to foreign goods and services. Our prediction is that total value of imports during the 1991 and 1995 period will exceed $350 billion US dollars. China's State Planning Commission and the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Economic Cooperation published recently a list of 210 key capital construction projects which China will undertake during the remainder of this decade. The package covers 23 sectors ranging from agricultural, energy, including coal, power, and oil, 
telecommunications to light industry and textiles, chemicals, and a wide spectrum of other projects such as machinery, electronics, environmental protection, building materials, forestry, and the pharmaceuticals. The, est the estimated need for investment totals 30 billion US dollars. This will certainly create many opportunities for our trading partners. Also, thanks to the government's preferential policies, foreign investment has been pouring into China in great amounts. By September this year, a total of 15300 foreign funded enterprises had received government approval with a contracted capital of 192 billion US dollars. Foreign capital now makes up close to 10% of China's total investment in fixed assets. The industrial output of foreign funded enterprises accounted for 8.5% of the nation's total in 1992, and the proportion is set to grow this year. China will continue to improve its investment conditions and give better guidance to foreign investors. According to its industrial policy, China will stress such areas for foreign investment as transportation, telecommunication, energy, key raw materials, water conservation, Conservancy, con conservation, machinery, electronics, petrochemicals, auto industry, and construction. Foreign funds will also be absorbed to speed up the technical renovation of existing state-owned enterprises. According to the Chinese State Statistics Bureau, the number of foreign-funded projects in 1993 may reach 100,000, a jump of 110% from 1992. Foreign capital actually used will increase 1.2 times to reach 24 billion US dollars. China's reform and opening open up program has led to a drastic rise of living standards for the Chinese people and changed the landscape of the entire country. Taken as a whole, China is still at a fairly low level of development, and modernization remains our long-term national top priority. Experience has shown that our success will hinge on political and social stability. Without stability, smooth progress in the modernization effort would be impossible. There's also the need to enhance socialist moral ethics and build a clean government Hence, we are carrying out a relentless campaign to crack down corruption. As China changes and embarks on fast economic growth, it is also reaching out to the Pacific Rim and beyond. In recent years, China has improved its relations with all its neighbors, including Japan, Vietnam, India, Russia, and other newly independent states from the former Soviet Union. We also enjoy excellent relations with Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines, Brunei, which are the members of ASEAN. With the establishment of diplomatic relations with Israel last year, China has official ties with every single country in the Middle East region. All this has opened up new opportunities for China to expand economic cooperation with its trading partners across the globe. Already, China's economy has become an important compo component of Asia-Pacific economy. Nearly 80% of China's trade and 90% of its investment take place within this region. The rapid growth in China has led to its gradual integration with the international economic trade system and created favorable conditions for China's greater participation in the Asia-Pacific economic cooperation. For one thing, China's trade volume with ASEAN countries has increased steadily over the years, amounting to over $8 billion for 1992. Looking toward the 21st century, we are keenly aware of the great opportunities 
as well as the serious challenges ahead. The disintegration of the Soviet Union has greatly reduced the danger of a new world war and increased the hope for maintaining world peace. But the international and regional situation has become more complicated, turbulent, sometimes turbulent, and volatile. Peace is yet to be established throughout the world. So development efforts still face difficulties. Against this backdrop of great changes in the world situation and renewed emphasis on peace and development, China's primary foreign policy objective remains one of maintaining world peace, promoting common progress, and creating a favorable environment for China's modernization. In pursuit of an independent foreign policy of peace, China stays away from arms race and refrains from joining any military bloc. We, we never seek spheres of influence, but always oppose hegemonism and power politics. As a permanent member of the U United Nations Security Council, China is keenly aware of its heavy responsibility in world affairs. China will continue to work with the international community to end regional conflicts, to advance international disarmament and arms control, promote collective economic development among all countries, and to strengthen cooperation in environmental protection, human rights, and other areas. This is where the China-US relationship comes in. Both China and the United States are great Pacific countries. As both have veto power in the United Nations Security Council, our two countries carry major weight in the world affairs.